morning, everyone, and welcome to worship this morning. It's lovely to see Sandra here in the meeting. Um, really lovely to see you, Sandra. You're very welcome. And also lovely to see Liesl's father here, Commissioner Hughes. So you're very welcome as well. And each one of you, may you be blessed by the service this morning. Just to bring to your attention um, a couple of announcements. Would you continue to pray for Sid Cook? Sid is in hospital. Um, they were hoping that he would get out, but he has been, um, he remains in hospital. So please continue to pray for Sid. And also for Captain Isabel Carson. Isabel um, took ill again and is in hospital also. So please remember them in your prayers. And also today, a lot of our young people are away, so we're depleted a little, um, but they're out on a youth retreat at Castle Wellen, and so we pray for them and hope they have a really blessed time there. And also just a little reminder, if you would pick up the news sheet, I'm not going to go through what's on every day of the week, you can read that for yourselves. But just a little reminder that at the back, there is a thank you um, which Liesl will draw to your attention later on in the meeting regarding the Christmas caroling and collecting. And now as we just go into worship here, we just pray that God's name will be uplifted and glorified. Thank you for your attention. Hallelujah. Thank you, Iris. Thank you. Yes, uh, I dropped off an excited um, handful of youngsters on Friday at Castle Wellen. My first time there, and for those of you who have been there and have memories of uh, music schools and different events there, what a beautiful setting, my goodness. Uh, Dad and I dropped them off on Friday and thought, gosh, we, we said to Jamie, it's haunted. And he went, no, it's not, is it? <laughs> But they were all very excited, so we, we really thank God for the blessing of each of those youngsters. And we pray for them this morning as we worship that the Lord will meet with them and, and do his work uh, there as he is at work here with us. And yes, there is a thank you in the newsletter for those, uh, for everyone who helped uh, over Christmas. Thank you for those who collected, those who uh, made soup in the kitchen for the band to be somewhere else, for, for those who played in the band, for those who helped to count. We, we are grateful to you and there's some, a little bit of information there for you about the caroling. So we're here to worship. We're here to worship. Psalm 117 says, praise the Lord. All you nations, praise him, all you people of the earth, for, the, for his unfailing love for us is powerful. The Lord's faithfulness endures forever. Praise the Lord. The Lord's faithfulness endures forever. And we're going to sing about that as we stand together. If you're able to stand and you'd like to stand with us to sing song 241.
Take your seats, please. Thank you. Bold, I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ, my own. We come to worship. And we're going to acknowledge that as we welcome one another and as we we become aware again that we've been scattered. We've been scattered throughout this week in the different places where we live, where we work, where we study, where we shop, where we are busy in the core, where we are serving others, where we're looking after family. And we come together this morning from all those places to worship God. And so I invite you to follow with me a brief responsive reading where I invite you to simply say that phrase, we come to worship. From different lives, we come to worship. From good weeks and bad weeks, we come to worship. Bringing great times and painful moments, we come to worship. Needing healing, needing peace, we come to worship. With hope in our hearts, we come to worship. Bringing ourselves, we come to worship. Together, in one place, we come to worship. I invite you to bow your heads in prayer with me just now. Lord, having lifted your name through our singing and acknowledging who you are to us and how wonderful your grace is for us, we pause and we still our hearts. Lord, we come to worship you from all the different places that we've been this past week and the things that have happened in our lives, we bring all of that with us because you care about every aspect of our lives. And we thank you that we can come with thanksgiving, we can come with joy, we can come with awe and wonder, and we can come with anxieties and worries, and we can come with hopes and dreams and we can come fearful of what is ahead. And Lord, however we come, we want to worship you. And we want that this time of worship would be enriching to us so that we don't leave this place as we were when we came in. But that in being together, in being in your presence, in sitting at your feet, your Holy Spirit can minister to us and bring us closer to you and transform us and send us out renewed and strengthened. Lord, we thank you because you're here. And as we welcome one another, we welcome you and we acknowledge that you welcome us 
into your presence. So be present in all that happens today. Be present with all those that we are mindful of just now, all those that we've mentioned in our announcements. Lord, be Lord of our, our congregation, our worship, our life today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and we worship a God who is faithful, and we sing about his great faithfulness. And we're going to use that lovely song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, as we also pray. And we, I'll, I'll have a couple of slides inviting us to pray for um, specific things this morning that, that the Lord may lay on your heart. So we're going to sing. Lawrence is going to help us um, as we sing, as he always does. Thank you, Lawrence. And we're going to sing the first verse and the chorus and then the second verse. But then in the second chorus, we'll just let Lawrence pray. And in the quietness, as we hear the music, we'll take opportunity to pray. So let's sing together. just now. Thank you, Andrew. We've heard the music playing and reminding us of this faithfulness. The faithfulness, not just to me, but I took the liberty of changing the word to us. That we as a people of God have known God's faithfulness. Together. Where have you been this week? Where, what situation might come to mind just now of where, where you've known God's beauty. Just take a moment to recall it and to give thanks to God for that in your heart. And when we come to the next chorus, if you feel like singing, then sing. But if you want to, the suggestion on the screen will be to pray for someone who needs to know God's faithfulness.
So if that's helpful to you to take that moment as the music plays and you pause in your singing to bring to the Lord that person or that situation, know that God is listening. Let's sing together the third verse. Thank you, Lawrence. thank God for, for that faithfulness to us as his people, individually and us together. And if you want to stand for the next song that we're going to sing, feel free to. It's a lovely song that speaks of the faithfulness of God. And we have some singing that will help us as we sing about the goodness of God. We've known God to be faithful and we trust that the goodness is yet to come and that the goodness runs after us and follows us wherever we go. Psalm 23 speaks of God going ahead and God's love following us. And so as we sing this song, become aware of that and let that lift you to the Lord and to know that those people that we've thought of, those situations of people who we know are missing this morning, some who are unwell, that God's faithfulness is with them too. Um, so if you feel like standing with me, then do that as we sing together. Thank you, Andrew. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hand. the goodness of God. God. 
the goodness of God and I will also hear from your word of the goodness of God and we're going to hear our Bible reading just now um, and it's a joy to have my dad coming to to read it for us he's Alec Hughes by the way not commissioner all right he's retired now <laughs> and he comes and he comes to share God's word thank you I'm retired now, but she still makes me work. <laughs> but it's a joy to be with you this morning once again here in Belfast, and I've look, been looking forward to it, and I'm thoroughly enjoying being in fellowship here this morning with you. The Bible reading is taken from uh, Exodus chapter 25, and I'm reading verses 1 to 9. And it's all about offerings for the tabernacle. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from each man whose heart prompts him to give. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze. Blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linen. Goat hair. Ram skins dyed red with hides of sea cows. Acacia wood. Olive oil for the light. Spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastplate. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Amen. Thank you. Let's give to God uh, in our offering just now. Thank you. we ask the Lord's blessing on our gifts. Dear Lord, we have so much to thank you for. You surround us each day with your love and your provision, and from your provision we are giving some back to you. We pray, Lord, that, this, that you will bless this offering and that others in turn will be blessed. For it is in your precious name we ask this. Amen. 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 
Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your giving. Now we heard, we heard the Bible reading earlier uh, where God spoke to Moses and said, Moses, get the people to bring their offerings for the building of the tabernacle. And that's in chapter 25. And if you read on to chapter 35, which is where we're going to pick up the Bible reading just now, in chapter 35, we see that things begin to happen. And so we read, I'm going to come to the reading in a moment, because I want you to help me build the picture of what happened just before. Okay, so in in chapter 35, verse 4, It says that Moses said to the whole Israelite community, this is what the Lord has commanded. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing is to bring to the Lord an offering of dot, 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 dot. Now around the hall are scattered some big pieces of paper with words on them. If you're near one, could you just shout what is on that piece of paper? Olive oil. Thank you. Right. Anyone have olive oil at home? We have loads. Yes. Okay. Olive oil. What else? Blue yarn. Okay. I salvaged some blue yarn. Blue yarn. What else? Gold. Right. Uh, People, bring your rings, please. (laughs) And your necklaces and your earrings. It does say, whatever you have, bring to the Lord. So we will pretend that all our earrings and all our gold are on the table there. Okay, what else? Acacia wood. wood. So uh, have we got any of that in the hall? Anyone got any acacia wood? (laughs) Uh, Okay, so all the wood. Imagine bringing all the wood that you have. Now that might have been the tree in your back garden, you had to saw it down and bring it. It might be your own dining table that you bring to the Lord as an offering. Who knows? What else? Silver. Silver. Okay. I don't, I I think I might have a necklace, silver necklace, but that looked like silver, so I brought that. Maybe you've got some silver around you. Uh, Maybe you can bring that to the Lord. We're coming to the bronze, don't worry. (laughs) Goat hair. (laughs) Nick, you're not allowed to say anything, okay? Your mother-in-law has got the goat hair. (laughs) So I'm not going to ask if anyone has goat hair. Um, That might be a little bit like it, a little little fur. So something something to bring to the Lord. What else? Hides of sea cows. So the leather, the the fur, the animals, different different animals that would have come here. I don't suspect anyone has any sea cows in their in their home to bring. No, no. Okay, what else? Pardon? Spices. So that's a little bit of uh, cinnamon and the leftover of Christmas spices that may reach you at some point this morning. The spices there would have been incense and uh, frankincense and and those kind of very strong aromatic spices that would have been used within the tabernacle to burn. And we're going to look at that more in more detail next week as Chris looks at the the furnishings that are within the tabernacle. What else? There might two or three more, I think. Right. Right, so we've got ram skins dyed red. I, couldn't, I didn't have any of those at home. But we will have the, 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 the skins of the rams so that the fur, but dyed red. So, I think someone else has got something this color. Somebody got this color? Purple yarn. So you would have had fabrics and furs and skins of these very important colors. Okay, what else? Fine linen. Fine linen. 
I haven't got any of that. I should have brought my tea towels. But if you have any linen tea towels at home, Irish linen, I should have brought the Irish linen. That wasn't very clever, was it? You all have that at home. And God said, bring what you have and bring it. Okay, is there one more, one or two more? Have we had everything? All the yarns, anybody got onyx or doesn't know how to say it maybe? It's onyx, it's tiny, I think it's onyx, is that right puppy? Onyx from Peru um, and Chile and, and other gems. So if you have any, any gems in your rings or any gems at home that are expensive, Moses said, bring it. And we read there that the people brought all these things to Moses. And then we pick up in verse 10 of chapter 35, that all who are skilled among you are to come and make everything the Lord has commanded. The tabernacle with its tent and its coverings, clasps, frames, crossbars, posts and bases, the ark with its poles and the atonement cover and the curtain that shields it, the table with its poles and its articles and the bread of the presence, the lampstand that is for the light with its accessories, lamps and oil for the light, hence the olive oil the altar of incense with its poles, the anointing oil, the fragrant incense, the curtain for the doorway at the entrance of the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offerings with its bronze grating, its poles and all its utensils, the bronze basin with its stand, the curtains of the courtyard with its posts and bases, and the curtain for the entrance to the courtyard, the tent pegs for the tabernacle and for the courtyard, and their ropes, the woven garments worn for ministering in the sanctuary, both the sacred garments for Aaron, the priests, and the garments for his sons when they serve as priests. Then the whole Israelite community withdrew from Moses' presence, and everyone who was willing and whose heart moved him came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work of the tent of meeting, for all its service and for the sacred garments. All who were willing, both women, both men and women alike, came and brought gold jewellery of all kinds, brooches, earrings, rings and ornaments, they all presented their gold as a wave offering to the Lord. Everyone who had blue, purple or scarlet yarn or fine linen or goat hair, ram skins dyed red or hides of sea cows brought them. Those presenting an offering of silver or bronze brought it as an offering to the Lord. And everyone who had acacia wood for any part of the work brought it. Every skilled woman spun with her hands and brought what she spun, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn or fine linen. And all the women who were willing and had the skill spun the goat hair. The leaders brought onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastpiece. They also brought spices and olive oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. All the Israelite men and women who were willing brought to the Lord free will offerings for all the work the Lord through Moses had commanded them to do. And then just a few verses of chapter 36. Then Moses summoned Bezalel and Oholiab and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and who was willing to come and do the work. They received from Moses all the offerings of the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning, so all the skilled craftsmen who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left their work and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. 
Then Moses gave an order and sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because they already had more, because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. We're going to look at that as we as we listen to God this morning together. Now there's a, a, a picture that is coming up, I think. And my apologies for a lady uh, sitting over there who's, who's on the picture. <laughs> I did ask for permission if it could go on Facebook. And Lottie said yes. Uh, so this happened in our open house um, a week, a week last Wednesday, um, we, had, we were celebrating the fact that uh, Lottie had completed her square dishcloth. Now, those of you who are knitters might think, oh, that was really easy. Um, but what excites me is that this little knitting corner just happened as part of Open House. We don't have a knitting session as such, but Anne always sits there with her knitting. Uh, and uh, Annie and Grace thought they'd join in as well. And Lottie thought, well, I haven't knitted for a number of years, shall we say, uh, I might pick it up again. And so they were encouraging each other, and there is Lottie having completed her square. Now we can move on to the next picture, just so that Lottie's not embarrassed anymore. Okay. The point is that I sit in awe of Anne every week, because Anne follows her patterns. Now, you might not be a knitter, but you may have been a Lego builder, in your younger years, um, I certainly was, uh, you may have had to follow a pattern for a recipe or a pattern for something that you were creating or building or, or even writing an essay or writing a report for work or knowing how to do the bank accounts. There is a certain pattern that is to be followed. Now, when I reflect on the knitting pattern especially, there is a catch that I've never been able to master. I've tried to follow patterns. Poor Chris had to wear a jumper that I made for him early when we were going out um, in our relationship. And bless him, he wore it for a while, but I don't think I would have worn it because it wasn't very good. Uh, the point is, at the very beginning of any knitting pattern, you have in very small print a little bit that says you have to do a tension square. Is that right, Anne? Yes, yeah, she's nodding. Because in that tension square, when you finish it, the tension square should show you how tight or how loose your knitting needs to be for it to be the right size. So it says that by the time you've finished 20 rows of so many stitches, it should measure so many centimeters. And that's where I've never gone right. My squares were always a different size. And so therefore, the rest of the pattern was, it looked like a jumper, but it wasn't quite as nicely fitting as it should have been because that tension square is so important. There is a pattern that needs to be followed. And as we begin to look at the tabernacle over this week and, and next week and the following week together, we hear these words from God to Moses. I am giving you a pattern to follow. If you follow the pattern, I will dwell among you. Now we heard last week as Chris spoke to us about the story of creation in Genesis, that mind-blowing account of how God acts in creation and he also follows a pattern. There's a pattern and an order that God creates in the chaos of what there is at the beginning that there is nothing and out of the chaos of, of the water and the wind and the, the spirit hovering above the waters, God creates order and he brings light into the darkness and the order of God creating stars that would govern the day and the night and, and give us a way of counting time and seasons and the order of creating various creatures that fly in the air and that swim in the sea and that walk along the ground and the order of creating human beings that God puts his image into them. And finally, when everything is in working order and God rests and God celebrates the creation that is flourishing, 
and does everything it was designed to do. A pattern of God dwelling in his creation in a garden that he planted in a little corner of Eden. And God gives his creation a pattern. And now, as we come to Exodus 25, God is creating a dwelling for himself again. And this time it's not in the garden, it's not something he creates. He is enabling his own people to create a dwelling for God so that they could know God's presence wherever they went as his people, that they would know God with them. God's presence is formed when we follow God's pattern. And for a brief moment, we're going to look at, there's a short video that gives us a, a visual look at what this tabernacle would have looked like. There's a lot of verses, uh, so we're not going to read them all, and instead, it follows from chapter 36 of Exodus. But have a look at the video and, and be present in that tabernacle. Watch it and, and see what there, there would have been as the people followed that pattern. Thank you, Andrew. The Tabernacle In Exodus 25, 8 through 9, God spoke to Moses, saying, Make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell in the midst of them, according to all that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its equipment, and so you will do. This portable temple was built in the wilderness by the Israelites, circa 1450 BC, after they were freed from Egyptian slavery. Moses was given specific instructions regarding the construction of the tabernacle in Exodus 26. The tent itself sat within a curtained enclosure that was supported by pillars. This courtyard was about a quarter of the size of an American football field. Several slaughtering tables stood within the court of the tabernacle, along with the bronze laver and the bronze altar. The tabernacle itself was a rectangular-shaped structure. Its roof consisted of multiple layers of animal skins and linens. An outer covering of tachash skin, which may have been porpoise, beaver, or a type of leather. A covering of ram skin dyed red. A curtain of goat's hair. And finally, a curtain of fine linen. The interior of the tabernacle was divided into two sections that housed a number of sacred objects. The first section, the holy place, contained the table of showbread the lampstand, and the altar of incense. Beyond a veil lay the Holy of Holies, or the Most Holy Place, which housed the Ark of the Covenant. The tabernacle was the first temple dedicated to God and the first resting place of the Ark of the Covenant. It served as a place of worship and sacrifices during the Israelites' 40 years in the desert and their subsequent conquest of the land of Canaan. This transportable house of worship was eventually replaced by a more permanent structure, King Solomon's Temple. The pattern to follow was God's pattern. Sorry, Lottie. It's just a helpful illustration. The pattern, the pattern. What was so important about that pattern? Was it that it was God's pattern rather than their own? You see, we have the instructions to Moses in Exodus 25. And in Exodus 35 and 36, they, they build the tabernacle. We have almost the same account of God saying, bring this. And then the people brought that and it was made. And in between... In Exodus 32, we have the account of where the people are, are so bored waiting for Moses because Moses has been up in the top of Mount Sinai receiving God's Ten Commandments, receiving the instructions for the tabernacle and all the things that are to go in it. It's oh, a very boring list of everything that you have to read. And then in chapter 32, the people are tired of waiting. And so they say to Aaron, Aaron, make us a God that will go before us. Because the God that brought us out of Egypt, we don't know where Moses is. We don't know what's happened to him. And so they take their earrings and they give them to Aaron. And Aaron melts all the gold and he fashions for them a golden calf. 
and the people worship the golden calf. And then Moses comes down from Mount Sinai and sees what it has happened and God says, this is wrong. And Moses has to start again and God has to start again and God has to say, it's not your pattern, it's my pattern. The people perhaps wanted to have a God that they could see a God that they could touch, a God that they could carry with them and say, this is a God that will go before us. We can see him. But if you picture again that, that pattern of God's tabernacle, it's a pattern that leads you to the mystery of who God is, to that holy of holies, to that place of the unseen it points us to a God that is earthy, a God that is about blood and gore and sacrifice and washing our hands and the different things that are at the front of the tabernacle, but it's a place of movement that takes you in towards the holy place where God is, where God is in the incense and the smoke, where God disappears into the ether, you could say, and and. And you can't pin him down into a statue. And God is saying, my pattern is different to your pattern. And I invite you to follow my pattern to really build me a home. God's pattern is about a very specific way of, of making that tabernacle. There's something about that form in the tabernacle that helps us to prepare a home for God. It's a place of movement. God doesn't just appear and give them a statue and says, this is where I am. God says, follow me through a room. And not just one room, but a room that has different places and different things to do in each room. There is a movement. And if following this pattern is so important for God's people to know God's presence. I wonder if there's anything in that pattern that might help us today to know God's presence in our daily living. As we look today and as we look next week and the week after at this tabernacle and different aspects of it, I wonder what will come out for you. I wonder if there's a, a part of that tabernacle that will be particularly for you. Something that will call out to you of God saying, this part of my pattern is important for you. God's presence is formed when we follow God's pattern rather than ours. But God's presence is also formed as we intentionally move towards him. That word move should be in there as we move towards him. God's instructions to Moses invited the people to see God's presence as something that they needed to prepare for. The design of the tabernacle has outer courts and then it has inner courts. It has outer places where there are, there's a place for sacrifices and washing. There's a place to wash your hands and a place to wash your heart. A place that would help you to focus on God. That would help you move from things that you can see and touch to help you become aware of who you are approaching. And then as you come to the holy of holies, to come to a place where God is experienced as the unseen. Thomas Aquinas, uh, an important Christian theologian and influential thinker, he taught that we can know God through our reason, that we can look around at creation as we did last week and look around at, at the mountains and the sea and the animals and, and ourselves and one another and say, there is a God. There is a God because who else could create this? But Thomas Aquinas says, that's not enough. We can know God through our knowing. We can know God through our actions. But there needs to be an inner 
revelation of God, for us to truly know God. And this is what the tabernacle was. It was an invitation to come close to God, to prepare ourselves to come close to God. And in the New Testament letter, James says to his readers, come close to God and God will come close to you. James too had known something of this movement. That as we come close to God, as we prepare ourselves to come close to God, we meet him. That God's presence isn't or can't be ordered or assumed or magically presented. But that God's presence, the fullness of God's presence with us comes when we prepare ourselves, when we move towards God when we go through that process of preparation. And you know, the fullness of God's presence isn't just here with us in this physical temple. The same tabernacle can be where you live, where you work, where you study, where you shop, where you serve God. And in Matthew's gospel, Jesus again echoes this pattern, assuring us that this movement isn't just about physically coming to a place, but about having this inner rhythm, this movement towards God within us all the time. In Matthew 11, where he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He says there, Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Share my yoke. Share my yoke. Walk with me. Work with me. For Thomas Aquinas, it was possible to have the right beliefs and the right actions, but it was only the transformation of our desires, that inner movement of our hearts, that inner focus, the direction of where our lives are going, along with belief and action that really showed God's presence within us. And so as we consider this tabernacle, we ask ourselves, How close do we choose to come to God? How intentional are we in seeking to know God's presence for ourselves, not just in the company here of God's people, but for ourselves, wherever we are? How often do we assume that God is here, so therefore let's just get on with it, Or how how intent are we in asking to really know God for ourselves? That our deepest desires might reflect God within us. Following the tabernacle pattern can help us to come close to God more than ever before. As we follow his pattern, as we move intentionally towards him. But at the end, we catch this glimpse, this picture of the tabernacle beginning to take shape. But it's done in community. God's presence is formed in community. The form of God's presence in this tabernacle happens not as a solo sport, but as a community. It happens as everyone gives. And as they give of what they have, your olive oil from the kitchen sideboard, and your earrings from your ears, and your table with the acacia wood, and not just what people had, but what they could do, their skills, the things that might be overlooked, and actually God had designed that those skills would be used in the building of this tabernacle. God's presence is 
formed in that community, but it's formed in an abundant community. And I love that phrase that we read right at the very end of our reading, where Moses has to say, stop, please stop bringing things. We've got enough. No more. Because God has provided an abundance. And you know, as we look around at our core, we are a place of abundance. We heard of the abundance of God in his creation last week. And in the building of the tabernacle, it's the same. As a church, as a salvation army, we have all that we need. God has given us everything that we need to build his tabernacle, to form his presence, to prepare a home for God. Have you ever realized that? That if God had provided everything that he needed then, he has provided for it here today. My friends, God dwells among us. God dwells among us and God dwells in the places where we move from day to day. And he invites us this morning to know that dwelling even more deeply. And so for you and for me this morning, what is it about this pattern that is most needed in your life right now? God has given us a pattern in the whole of creation. He gives us a pattern that he gave to his family, to the people of God. He gave us a pattern in in Jesus to follow and to walk with him, to share his walk. And this morning he says again to us, come close, come prepared, come willingly, come with what you have in your hands, come with what costs you. Come with your possessions and your skills. Come asking God if the desires of your heart are what they need to be. Come close to God here. Come close to God out there. So what part of this pattern is for you today? Ask God what that is for you and respond this morning. He invites you to do that because he wants you to be close. And as you come close to him, he will come close to you. He promises that. So we're going to sing together song 371, a lovely song that says, I will offer up my life in spirit and truth. I will surrender. I will give what I have. And as we do that, as we choose to give to God, We walk through this tabernacle and we come to his presence. So I invite you to sing together with me as you respond to the Lord and as you you bring what it is that he's asking you to bring. And as always, our place of prayer is open just to come and pray, to come and bring to the Lord what you have for him. And as we bring our daily life to him, he comes and he comes close. So let's sing together. Thank you, Lauren.
ask Lawrence. Lawrence, would you just play the, the chorus, just the chorus three for us? The words said, what can I bring? What can I bring? I wonder what the Lord is asking you to bring as you listen to the music. Jesus, this morning we thank you for your invitation to come close to you. We thank you for this image of people bringing what they had to build you a home. Lord, we, we want to bring ourselves to you. And sometimes it's hard because we feel we don't have much to bring you. Or maybe we've brought you so much in the past, we don't know what else we could bring. Or we look at others and we think that what they bring is so much better than what we have. And yet, Lord, if we were willing to bring exactly what we have and just trusted you with it you would build a home where everyone would know that you are present lord we ask you that today and and as we journey through this tabernacle together over the coming weeks will you speak to us will you open our eyes to things that we've not seen before Will you open our hearts that we may want to bring you the significant and the insignificant and trust you with it? Lord, thank you that you've given us everything we need. We love you and we thank you that you want to make your home among us. We want to build this for you and for your honor and as our worship to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's sing together our, our final song this morning, Tell Out My Soul.
Amen. Amen. I pray that as you go from here in all those places where you live, may you tell out the glories of the Lord. May you tell of his greatness. May you tell of his might. May you tell of his glory. May you know his presence and his promise. May you know his love for you and all those that you live among. God bless you. God bless you. Amen.